Last time we were together in Isaiah, we uh, finished chapter 9, but we interpreted that to include the first four verses of chapter 10. In other words, we got down through chapter 10, verse 4, if my reckoning is correct. In other words, we did chapter 9, but we recognized that the first four verses of chapter 10 were, in effect, uh, the completion of thought of chapter 9. So chapter 10 continues with Isaiah predicting judgment upon the empire of Assyria. You know, we talk a lot about ancient empires, but one thing I just might mention about the Assyrian Empire, it endured for 700 years. It was a major part of the ancient world. And uh, God used it, of course, to judge the northern kingdom, what we call the House of Israel. But uh, just as God will use these various Gentile nations to chastise his people at the same time, what goes around comes around, in a sense. Uh, God ultimately judges those nations also. So the Assyrians happened to be used by God for his purposes, but they were motivated by pride and all of that, and God brings them down. And Isaiah talks a great deal about that in several places, and chapter 10 is one of those. But chapter 10 has some interesting techniques that I think you'll relate to that uh, Isaiah uses here. Pick it up about verse 5, chapter 10, verse 5. O Assyrian, the rod of mine anger the staff in whose hand is mine indignation. So this is uh, God speaking of, it, of Assyria as his instrument. That doesn't absolve them of their comeuppance, which is coming too, but that's an interesting uh, phrase, the rod of mine anger. One of the things you can do on your own, by the way, we won't take the time here because it would derail the whole study, but I encourage you to get a concordance and do a study of the Assyrian in the Bible. The Assyrian is a title, of course, of the leader of the Assyrian Empire, that's the denotative use of it. The connotative, a broader use, the idiomatic use of it, is that it also is used as a title of the Antichrist. And that may surprise you. The Antichrist, in effect, the person we call the Antichrist, I happen not to like that term, but I think we're stuck with it, has about 33 titles in the Old Testament, and the Assyrian is one of them. That doesn't necessarily mean that he's of an Assyrian background. It's an idiom just as Satan is spoken of as the king of Babylon, we'll see in chapter 14, we'll deal with that when we get there. But the point is, be sensitive to some of these labels. It's interesting, too, that the Pharaoh that knew not Joseph, if you recall, Jacob and the family went down to Egypt, and they prospered down there. As the generations went on, of course, we read in the book of Exodus that what emerged was a Pharaoh who knew not Joseph. In other words, that was not favorable to the people of Israel. And, of course, we all know the story of Pharaoh and Moses delivering Egypt, the ten plagues, and all of that. What you may not realize is that Pharaoh was not Egyptian. We're indebted to Isaiah. Later on in the book, we'll deal with that, that apparently Pharaoh was not Egyptian. He was Assyrian. And as we understand that, we begin to appreciate why he was so paranoid and insecure, because his slave population had grown so large, and he did not have an indigenous Egyptian following. So that helps us understand a little bit about the slippery rock he may have been standing on in the, in the book of Exodus. But we'll get into that a little later in Isaiah. But I like to alert you, at least as you study the Bible, to be sensitive to the possible idiomatic or typological terms of the Assyrian. But in any case, we'll move on now. Verse 6, God says, I will send him against the hypocritical nation, against the people of my wrath, will I command him to take spoil and to take a prey and to tread them down like mire in the streets. Well, that's pretty straightforward. God is uh, going to use him to accomplish his purpose. What you may miss, because you're not reading in the Hebrew, is that to uh, command him to take the spoil and take a prey, that's the name of one of these two sons of Isaiah. Remember? How hard it was to pronounce, but that's what it meant. Remember? Uh, the haste bakes waste guy. Later on, we're also going to find out that the one that uh, uh, the remnant shall return will also surface in this language here, the Mahar Shahal Hajbaz. So you remember, that was the, that's what surfaces here, in effect, is behind the language in verse 6. There's sort of a pun involved. But verse 7, how be it? He meaneth not so, neither does his heart think so, but it is in his heart to destroy and to cut off nations, not a few. For he saith, are not my princes altogether kings? The word princes really should be vassals. In other words, the, the head of Assyria had a decentralized form of organization. The Assyrian Empire had vassal kings under the numero uno, if you will. And he says, uh, are not my princes altogether kings? So, by the way, do you see the analogy there? That makes the head of the Assyrian Empire the king of kings. Actually, king's king of vassals, but you can follow that through yourself. 
But then he goes on with a few phrases here that may go by us because we haven't done our homework. In verse 9, is not Calno like Karshemesh, is not Hamath like Arpad, is not Samaria like Damascus? Well, Calno was in the lower Mesopotamia. It was a city of Nimrod mentioned in Genesis 10 uh, where the Tower of Babylon was built. In fact, that is inserted in the Septuagint translation here. It was desolate in Amos' day, but that's Calno. Karshemesh is one of the old cities you should know. Calno, you may remember from Genesis 10, but other than that, it's probably not that significant your, on your horizon. But Karshemesh should be, because it was Karshemesh is the, was the northern capital of the Hittites. It was conquered by Sargon in 717 B.C., but the main thing is that it will become important a little later in our narrative because Karshemesh is the battle where Nebuchadnezzar establishes Babylon as the world ruler because... Uh, his father, who was, who was king of uh, this little town called Babylon, had his son, the, the general. And uh, the Battle of Karshemish is one of the big final turning points in the emergence of the Babylonian Empire. Battle of Karshemish, 606 B.C. See, the writer is making a comparison. Aren't these new cities like the victories of the old, so to speak? Karshemish is referred to because Sargon had conquered it back in 717. Kalna was back in 738 B.C., even earlier. And Hamath was a Canaanite city and uh, was an independent monarch at the time of David. In any case, uh, and Arkbad was uh, reduced by tilgath pileser the king of Assyria, uh, early in his reign. And um, it revolted against him and was severely punished in response, about 740. And it's not Samaria like Damascus. The fall of Samaria was 722. Damascus had fallen 10 years earlier, 732. Anyway, these are just contrasts of current victories compared to earlier victories. It's sort of a thumb under the suspenders kind of brag on the part of the Assyrians, in effect. Verse 10, as my hand hath found the kingdoms of the idols, and whose carved images did excel them of Jerusalem and Samaria, shall I not, as I have done unto Samaria and her idols, do so to Jerusalem and her idols? See, that's the brag of the Assyrians. The Assyrians do not succeed against Judah. Hundred years later, Babylon will, but the Syrians do not. They're bragging, they aspire to, they hope to. God is saying, no, in effect, no way. Verse 11, shall I not, as I have done unto Samarian idols, do so to Jerusalem and her idols? So this is the brag of the Assyrians. Verse 12, wherefore it shall come to pass that when the Lord hath performed his whole work upon Mount Zion and on Jerusalem, I will punish the fruit of the stout heart of king of Assyria and the glory of his high looks. One of the things you can you obviously are sensitive to is God hates pride. And he hates sin, of course, but the root of sin is pride. We're going to discover when we get chapter 14 why God specifically hates pride. Because that's where sin starts, in the heart of Satan. It was Satan's pride that introduces the whole issue of sin. So God hates pride. The symbol for sin in the Levitical ideology is leaven. Unleavened bread was the idea of being sin-free. In other words, leaven was a type of sin. Why? Because it corrupts by puffing up. That's one way of describing the whole concept of leaven, if you will. Idiomatically speaking, obviously. Verse 13, For he saith, By the strength of my hand I have done it, and by my wisdom, for I am prudent, for I have removed the boundaries of the people, and have robbed their treasures, and I have put down the inhabitants like a valiant man. And my hand hath found as a nest the riches of the people, and as one gathereth eggs that are left, have I gathered all the earth, and there was none that moved the wing, nor opened the mouth, or peeped. <laughs> Even in the English translation, you, you get a sense of the eloquence, the elegance, the, the style of Isaiah, the highest level of Hebrew writing. And, of course, he's drawing the analogy of someone robbing a nest and no one rebutting it. This is the brag of the Assyrians. I'm always intrigued when I've seen an idiom like this, you know, like, uh, I found as a nest the riches of the people. And I'm reminded of Matthew 13, if you recall. Remember what birds are in parables. Ministers of Satan. Remember the four soils? The sower that went out in the four soils? And in one of those cases, the, the birds in the field picked up the seed. And then later on, you find those birds even make a nest in this grotesque, monstrosity of a mustard seed, which is normally a bush that grows into a tree. Those parables are very often misunderstood. And I strongly encourage you, if you've never done so, is to get Chuck Smith or mine or whoever tapes on Matthew 13 
and really understand the seven kingdom parables because they're often mistaught and misunderstood because of a lack of real perspective. And so I encourage you to to repair that if you haven't done it or if it's been a while, review that. But anyway, we'll move on. It's incidental to our purpose here. I think I have wandered from the main course you know, once or twice in previous years. Uh, I'll try to watch that now. Yeah. Uh, verse 15, shall the axe boast itself against him that heweth with it? Or shall the saw magnify itself against him that shaketh it? As if the rod should shake itself against those who lift it up, or if the staff should lift up him that is not wood. Now, of course, he's referring here to the Assyrians as an instrument of God, right? As if it's boasting itself. But whenever I read this sort of thing, I'm always reminded of the same thing today. You see, we have the same concept that underlies evolution. It's the paper that wrote the book. See, that's the whole concept of evolution, isn't it? And they don't see the evidence of a designer. They see design in nature and assume that nature designed itself. That's like saying the paper wrote the book. Same idea. It would confuse the medium with the artist. But in any case, we'll, that's perhaps very peripheral. Let's move on. Verse 16. Therefore shall the Lord, the Lord of hosts, send among his fat ones leanness, and under his uh, glory shall he kindle a burning fire like the burning of a fire. And the light of Israel shall be for a fire, and his holy one for a flame. It shall burn and devour his thorns and his briars in one day. Verse 12 says the whole work on Mount Zion, and verse 17 says in one day. So when it comes, it's going to come hard and quick. In verse 17, we also have an introduction of another title of God, the light of Israel. Interesting title. You should be reminded of John chapter 1, verse 9. Who is the light of the world? Who is the light of the world? Jesus, you betcha. And uh, he came unto his own, but his own received him not, it says in verse 11. Who were his own? The Jews, exactly. And so it's interesting that the light of Israel is, who is it referring to? Who's the light of Israel? Jesus Christ, specifically. And the light of Israel shall be for a fire, and his holy one for a flame. And it shall burn and devour his thorns and briars in one day. The second coming of Jesus Christ. I'm not talking about the rapture now. I'm talking about the second coming in authority. He comes back twice. Once for the church and once for Israel. To fulfill all the promises. But that comes with judgment and vengeance. The day of vengeance of our God. We'll discover when we get to chapter 61 of Isaiah. The very mandate that Jesus uses to open his ministry. I finally read chapter 61 of Isaiah. The first two verses. In the, in the synagogue, and says, This day is that prophecy fulfilled in your ears. He announces, he opens his ministry with a mandate out of Isaiah chapter 61, but he leaves off the last phrase. He finishes it. When he gets to a comma, he puts a period in effect, closes the book, sits down, and says, This day is that fulfilled in your ears. He didn't finish verse 2 of Isaiah 61. He left off a phrase. The phrase he left off was the day of vengeance of our God. That's yet to be fulfilled. Most of us, unless we've done a very diligent study of the scripture, they haven't the slightest perception of what Jesus will be about when he comes back. Isaiah will spread it out for us very clearly in chapter 63 and other places. So we'll get to that as we go. Verse 18, continuing the thought, And shall consume the glory of his forest and of his fruitful field, both soul and body, and they shall be as when a standard bearer fainteth, and the rest of the trees of his forest shall be few that a child can write them down. In other words, not much left. But Isaiah always, in these passages where he lays it down on them, also always reminds them that a remnant shall return. Verse 20, It shall come to pass in that day that the remnant of Israel, and such as, has, as have escaped of the house of Jacob, shall no more again lean upon him who smote them, but shall lean upon the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, in truth. Verse 21, And a mere remnant that's really what the Hebrew implies. A mere remnant shall return, even the remnant of Jacob, unto the mighty God. The remnant shall return, even the remnant of Jacob, unto the mighty God. It's interesting, after the Babylonian captivity, how many people returned? We talk about the return from Babylon. How many were there? About 50,000. Not much. 42,000 plus another seven, some other odds. It depends on how you number it. I won't be precise on the numbers, but in Ezra, you'll discover that the remnant that returned from Babylon after they were freed by Cyrus the Persian were nominal. Indeed, a remnant. That's always the model. 
as you study the scripture, it's always a remnant. Out of the old world in Genesis 6 on, how many were saved out of the entire world? Out of the several billion, probably. How many were saved? Eight. Yeah. Interesting. Eight is the number of new beginnings. Verse 22. For though thy people Israel be like the sand of the sea, yet a remnant of them shall return, and the full end decreed shall overflow with righteousness. For the Lord God of hosts shall make a full end, even determined in the midst of all of the land. Verse 24. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of hosts, O my people that dwell in Zion, be not afraid of the Assyrian. He shall smite thee with a rod, and he shall lift up a staff against thee after the manner of Egypt. It's very interesting to see how often God makes reference to the deliverance from Egypt. You'll notice throughout the, the Old Testament, again and again and again, God alludes to himself as the one that delivered Israel from Egypt. And even here, where they're talking about the business of Assyria, and again, you'll, you'll see all through here, starting this verse, but several other places, there are these parallels being drawn. And uh, I encourage you to be sensitive to that when you study the book of Exodus to realize that that is a very pivotal, fundamental piece of learning. The ten plagues in Egypt and the whole deliverance that uh, God engineers through Moses. The Passover, model of Jesus Christ, but the whole deliverance is, is worthy of your study because it's a pattern of revelation and it's a pattern that is, is repeated and, and frequently alluded to. And it's interesting that um, these comparisons, just after the, after the deliverance of Egypt, we also have the Song of Moses as an interlude. After Isaiah 10 and 11, we're going to have Isaiah 12, which is a, a psalm, a little psalm tucked in the book of Isaiah. But uh, we're getting ahead of ourselves. Verse 25, For yet a little while, and the indignation shall cease, and mine anger in their destruction. And the Lord of hosts shall stir up a scourge for him, according to the slaughter of Midian at the rock of Oreb. And as his rod was upon the sea, so shall he lift it up after the manner of Egypt. Mixing metaphors here a little bit. The slaughter of Midian at the rock of Oreb makes reference to Joshua 7. That's Gideon and all of that. Remember, Gideon and his 300. It's an allusion to that, which, of course, is historical. But again, Isaiah doesn't leave it at that. He goes again and draws another parallel again to Egypt. As his rod was upon the sea, so shall he lift it up after the manner of Egypt. And that's, of course, Exodus 4 and 14 and so on. Verse 27, shall come to pass in that day that his burden shall be taken away from off thy shoulder and his yoke from off thy neck, and the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointed one. It says anointing in some of your Bibles, perhaps it's a person, the anointed one. The yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointed one. There's lots of background we could dig out here. Um, back here in verse 26, and the scourge for him according to the slaughter of Midian, that was really the destruction of Sennacherib. You'll find that in 2 Kings 19, for those of you who want to tie this into the, to the chronological, uh, the historical narrative, you might link that to 2 Kings 19. And of course, the rod of Moses is in Exodus 4, verses 3 and 4, and Exodus 14. And when you study the rod of Moses, make a distinction between the rod of Moses and the rod of Aaron and so forth. There's some subtleties that you can draw little diagrams and study with. But that's, uh, again, the study out of Exodus. I'll leave that for those of you that want to plunge into that. Okay, now the anointed one here is a double reference in a sense because it, of course, refers to Hezekiah because he will be a, a, a key king there. And that's Second Samuel 19 and Second Kings 11. I'll also allude to in Lamentations 4, verse 20. But, of course, the broader allusion is, of course, to the Messiah. You know, this is all, of course, the Syrian goes on, but I, I'm fascinated with the way Isaiah presents verse 28 and on. And um, um, obviously, in a casual reading, you miss some of the what's almost humor here, because what Isaiah is going to do, he's predicting the Assyrian attack, and he does it by issuing war bulletins in advance. You see, he talks as if he's a TV announcer narrating it in real time. Okay? Notice how, what Isaiah says. He is gone to Aeth. He is passed to Migron. At Mishmash, he hath stored his baggage. They have gone over the pass. They have taken up the lodging at Geba. Ramah is afraid, and Gibeah of Saul is fled. Lift up thy voice, O daughter of Galam. Cause it to be heard, O Eliasha, O poor Anathoth. 
Mebinah is removed, the inhabitants of Gibim gather themselves to flee, and as yet he shall remain at Nob that day. He shall shake his hand against the mount of daughter of Zion, the hill of Jerusalem. Behold, the Lord God of the Lord, but the Lord, the Lord of hosts, shall lop the bow with terror, and the high ones of stature shall be hewn down, and the haughty shall be humbled, and he shall cut down the thickest of the forest with iron, and Lebanon shall fall by a mighty one. Now, obviously, most of us will miss the pace here unless you have a little background here. But verse 28, he has come to Ai. That's in Joshua chapter 8. And for those of you who want to look in that, it's about three miles south of Bethel, but to put it in perspective for you and I, it's about 30 miles northeast of Jerusalem. Isaiah and his constituency is where? In Jerusalem. So when he says Ai, think 30 miles away. Okay? He has come to Ai. He has passed to Migron. Okay, Migron, that's the Gibeah of Benjamin, 1 Samuel 14. That's about, um, uh, all that's about 30 miles north or so. At Mishmash, he has stored his baggage. Mishmash is seven and a half miles north of Jerusalem. See, these places are progressively closer. You follow me? You see, he's speaking geographically. He's dropping these names. And yes, you can look up in concordance and stuff, chase this down. Uh, Mishmash uh, is where Jonathan was against the Philistines. It's a very, very diff for those of you with military uh, backgrounds, uh, you probably know it's a very difficult place to attack. 1 Samuel 14 is a place to dig into that if you want to. Verse 29, Geba, or Geba is uh, about uh, six miles northwest. And uh, the passage, you get, it refers to 1 Samuel 13. Ramah is about six miles north of Jerusalem. The Gibeah of Saul is about four miles north of Jerusalem. And then in, uh, in verse 30, uh, Gallim is the birthplace of the second husband of Michael, for whatever that's worth, Saul's daughter, if you recall. Elish is, um, again, uh, north of Jerusalem. Anathoth is, the, is a city of refuge, if you recall from Joshua, chapter 21. But it's also Jeremiah's birthplace. But the main point here, it's about three miles north, see? Then we have uh, Madnia and Gabim, which are about one to two miles north. Gabim, which are about one to two miles north and their cisterns north of Jerusalem. Now we get to Nob. Nob is inside of Jerusalem. It's about what we call today Mount Scopus. It was a, a priestly city uh, destroyed by Saul in 1 Samuel 22. But the main point here in the spirit of this, this passage is it's inside. In other words, what Isaiah is saying, let me paraphrase this, you see. Verse 28 says, he's 30 miles north of Jerusalem. No, no, he's seven and a half. No, no, he's six, four miles, then three, then one to two. Now he's within sight. Film in 11. And, and he shall remain, verse 32, he shall remain at Nob that day, and he shall shake his hand against the mount of the daughter of Zion, the hill of Jerusalem. Behold the Lord God, the Lord oh, shall lop the bow with terror, and the high winds of stature shall be hewn down, and the haughty shall be humbled, and he shall be cut down. He shall cut down the thickets of the forest with iron, and Lebanon shall fall by a mighty one. So they're going to attack. They're going to threaten Jerusalem. But God interferes. Because who conquered Jerusalem? Not the Assyrians. Babylon will 100 years later. And the northern kingdom fell in 722 B.C. The southern kingdom, Judah, Jerusalem, fell to Nebuchadnezzar, the successor to the Assyrians, in 606 B.C., essentially, to give you a rough flavor of it. So that's probably as much damage as we can do to chapter 10 for one evening. It's a, a basically a, a chronicle of the judgment uh, both by and then on Assyria. Now we get to chapter 11. What makes Isaiah so much fun is, yes, he has these heavy-duty passages, and yet he... He sprinkles it with little surprises. And chapter 11 is one of those sprinkles. He changes, he shifts gears here, changes the subject. Verse 1, and there shall come forth a rod, or I uh, can rephrase that, a twig, out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. This is, in a sense, it's speaking in, in uh, tree terms, but it's speaking of a family tree, you see. Out of the stem of Jesse. What came out of Jesse? Jesse was the father of whom? David. You betcha. And a branch shall grow forth out of his roots. Even though it's cut down, there's going to be a branch, a twig, a, a sprout. Now, what you miss here is the, uh, is the word branch, by the way. The branch of Jeremiah in chapter 23 and 33 is a king. The branch of Zechariah, chapter 3 and chapter 6, is a man. The branch here in Isaiah is a nutzer. And there's a pun, a Hebrew pun involved, because a Netzer is a Nazarene. 
So Jesus Christ is the branch of Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1, but he's also a Nazarene. And if you, in the Hebrew, is that there's a, a play on words. Follow me? Because obviously he was a Nazarene, he grew up in Nazareth. But more importantly, in a sense, he was a netzer of, of uh, uh, Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1. Now he is a, he's also, spoke, one of his many titles of Jesus Christ is the root of David. You find that in Romans 15, 12. You find it in Revelation 22, verse 16. I personally uh, suggest we take a look at Revelation 5, just to pick one of these several references. Oh, on the way to Revelation, let's stop off at Matthew 2. That's nothing else that'll sell more tabs at the bookstore. At the last verse of Matthew 2, Matthew says he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. And those prophets, plural, he shall be called a Nazarene. And this refers to Isaiah chapter 11. Because as, as a, a, a rod or a netzer out of the stem of Jesse. Matthew here, if you track this down, is, on a, is, is dealing in effect with a pun, right? By the way, while we're here, I can't resist this because I keep running into this kind of thing. You know, I get, the, I get all kinds of people. I get these guys on the radio asking questions and stuff and trying to stir up trouble. And while well, you're quoting things out of context... Well, if you're making doctrine, that's a very valid, important issue. But at the same time, don't blind yourself. I'd like you to, while we're in Matthew 2, look at verse 15. Remember when, uh, as an infant, Joseph and Mary took Jesus down to Egypt, right? And verse 15 says, And they were there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which is spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt I have called my son. And what he's quoting from is Hosea chapter 11, verse 1, where it says that, but there's no way you can read Hosea chapter, verse 1 of chapter 11 and call that messianic but for the inside of Matthew. So one of the insights, I think, is that we get from the Scripture is to notice how the prophets speak of it. All prophets take Scripture literally. Okay. Secondly, it's also interesting that hidden away in some of these, quote, contexts are second or third level meanings. And that's obviously what Matthew is leaning on in Hosea chapter 11, verse 1. And that's sort of what he's doing in verse 23, when he speaks of Jesus Christ as a netzer, as a Nazarene. There's a pun involved. The Holy Spirit deals in puns and similitudes and models. And if I made a list of rhetorical devices that you'll find in the Scripture that the Holy Spirit uses, there are over 50 different rhetorical technicalities in the Scripture for what it's worth. But we're not a students of rhetoric. We're students of Jesus Christ. We were on our way to Revelation 5, I believe. Very, very key passage. Revelation chapter 5, I saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. Jeremiah 32 and the book of Ruth revealed what that scroll really is. It's the title deed. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice who is worthy to open the scroll and loose its seals. And no man has to be a kinsman of Adam, no man in heaven, nor on earth, neither under the earth. That's interesting dichotomy of the universe. No man in heaven or on earth is a third place under the earth. We're able to open the scroll and need to look upon it. And John says, I sobbed convulsively because no man was found worthy to open them and to read the book, neither look upon it. Because John, under, you and I may miss the point, John didn't. He understood the significance for the redemption of all creation. Not, no one was eligible, but there's one exception, fortunately, verse 5. And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah. The lion of the tribe of Judah. I love that. The lion was the ensign of the tribe of Judah. The, that was the ensign for not just Judah, but the, the, the three tribes that camped to the east of the tabernacle, the camp of Judah. The tabernacle surrounded by the lion, the ox, the man, and the eagle. The four, four symbols, the four faces of the cherubim, interestingly enough. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the title of Jesus Christ. I love it when someone says, gee, what sign are you? I say, I was born in May, I'm a Leo. They look at me, what? If you're born in May, you must be a Gemini. No, no, I'm a Leo. How can you be a Leo born in, in, in May? And that opens, that's it. They just step right into it, you see. 
They stepped right into it. Well, I'm a Leo because I'm the you know I, I'm under the line of the tribe of Judah. That's the, that's what it really was. That was long before Babylon. That's what it really all about the twelve the twelve constellations, the signs of the twelve tribes. And I'm a Leo because you know you're not Jewish, are you? Yes. No, I'm not. But the God I worship is. That's also a good stopper. That causes you. Know, The Lion of the Tribe of Judah, that's one title. Here's the other title, The Root of David. The Root of David. See, it comes out of Isaiah again. It's one of the titles of Jesus Christ. It's a root. Yes, it's an idiomatic of a tree, but it's a family tree. It's a gene genealogical tree. He hath prevailed to open the scroll and loose the seals. And I love this. You see, you start, John turns, expecting to see what, a lion? No, he's speaking idiomatically. He turns, he said... And, and, and I beheld, lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lion? No, no, no. A lamb as it had been slain. The lamb as it had been slain, my friends. What does that mean? Yes, it's the lamb, the Passover lamb. Remember John the Baptist introduces Jesus Christ publicly. Behold, the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. What a Jewish title. That's not a Gentile title. That's a Jewish title. It's Gentile. What's Passover? You know? Passover. The lamb. That's the title. And here he is, the lamb. But wait a minute, as it had been slain. Did Jesus Christ be bear the marks of his crucifixion after he was raised from the dead? You betcha. Thomas had no man see, right? So he still bears those marks. Wait a minute, gang. He was so badly disfigured that none of it, nobody recognized him after his resurrection at first. Even John closed his gospel when they were there at the seashore. None of us dared ask him, for we knew it was him. What, John? Why did he put that remark in there? They ripped off his beard. He said, Isaiah will deal with this. We'll get into some of the aspects that he still bears for you and I throughout eternity. But we're getting ahead of the story. Isaiah will deal with that when we get to chapter 50 and whatever. We're still back here in 11, as I recall. More or less, give or take a few... Well, we get to verse 1. Let's move on to verse 2. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2. Interesting verse for you, Revelation friends. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and, the spirit and, the, and of the fear of the Lord. Well, now that's kind of interesting. Let's turn to Revelation chapter 1. I should have had you put a finger here to... Save your tabs here a little bit. Revelation chapter 1, verse 4. It's like a memo, John 2, you know, from 2, you know how a corporate memo works, right? John, that's from, to who? Seven churches, which are in Asia. Grace be unto you, and peace. And it comes from three people, the grace and peace comes from three people. From him who, who is and was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead, and uh, the ruler of the kings of the earth. Well, we're used to seeing the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. No problem there. The third one, have and Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the first... By the way, in the first chapter, 24 titles, this is the data division for you programmers, in the first chapter of Revelation, 24 titles are introduced, and there are labels all through the rest of the book. It's an identity. It's a data dictionary or whatever terms you want to use. I don't know if you're COBOL or what kind of programs you are. So Jesus Christ, we have those titles, the faithful witness, no problem, the first begotten of the dead. That's not, means he's begotten. It's a, it's a positional thing. And the ruler of the kings of the earth. No problem there. No problem with the first one. From him who is and who was and who is to come. You know, the self-existent one, the Asher, Ichyach Asher, the voice of the burning burst. No problem there, the father. Huh? But wait a minute, who's this middle guy? We have it for him who is and who was and is to come, no problem. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne. Who is that? The Holy Spirit, you betcha, but it's an Old Testament idiom for the Holy Spirit. You generally don't find that in Paul's epistles. So if you don't find it in Paul's epistles, most of us find it a little strange. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not knocking, really mastering the epistles. I'm just saying part of our fumbling or stumbling or what have you in the book of Revelation is our ignorance of the Old Testament. 357 direct quotes of the Old Testament book of Revelation. Very, very, a very, very Jewish book in a sense. Well, the seven spirits which are before his throne, what is seven? The number of completeness. Seven, by the way, is not the number of holy. A lot of people misunderstand that. Go to Las Vegas. There's sevens there too. That's not holy. Seven is idiomatically in the scripture, 
the number of completeness. Satan has seven heads, ten horns. You follow me? So seven isn't necessarily holy. It's complete. The seven spirits are the complete spirit, the sevenfold spirit. The seven letters of seven churches. Those aren't the most important seven churches. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea. You pick seven churches in, in, the, in the ancient world, you wouldn't come up with those seven. Where's the church in Jerusalem? Where's the church in Antioch? Laconium, Derby. You can mention all kinds of churches that were important. Church of Rome. Why those seven? Because those seven turn out to represent all churches. The complete church, idiomatically speaking. And Jesus maps all of church history chronologically and all of church, all churches spiritually in the sevenfold dimensions of those seven churches. So the seven is completes the complete church in a sense. Where is Jesus Christ? In the midst of them. And yet where are they in his hand? Interesting study in, the, in, in Revelation. Jesus is always with his church. Remember that when you start getting the post-trib check verses. That's nonsense. Verse 2, the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. Now, most of us would read this, you see, as, as, as this, that's the generic, and then these other six are subdivisions. I'm not going to badger that. The point is there's the Spirit of the Lord, whatever that means, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. There's seven spirits there. What's interesting to me is there's one and then three pairs. When I mentally walk into the tabernacle on the left side, what do I see? The menorah right? All gold, solid gold, speaking of Christ's deity. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. The only light of the tabernacle was the menorah, who identifies Jesus Christ. He further says something else. I am the vine, ye are the branches. What's the number of man? Six. Put he and the six together, you get seven, you got the menorah. I am the vine, ye are the branches. What are the branches? Three pairs. I'm fascinated that I just see behind this I don't mean to sound like a mystic. I guess I am. Verse 2, the Spirit of the Lord, the singular, shall rest upon him. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding, that's a pair. A spirit of counsel and might, that's a pair. And the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, that's a pair. There's something else that you catch here if you've really done your homework. The Spirit of counsel and might. That's kind of interesting. The temple that Solomon built had something the tabernacle didn't. We study the tabernacle as the mob, the basic architectural model for the temple, and that's fine, it certainly is, and yet there's something added in the temple that was not in the tabernacle. It's called the porch. And what characterized the porch? Two gigantic pillars. What were the pillars made of? Fronds or brass, you bet. What did they hold up? Nothing. What were their names? Yaakov and Boaz, Council and Might. Really? Now, turns out that if you study the architecture of the temple, you'll discover it will parallel a number of different things, among which are the seven spirits of God. And that starts to give us a whole new insight when in, in the New Testament seven times the Holy Spirit tells you, you are the temple of God. What does that mean? And secondly, there's another thing the temple had in, in Jerusalem that the tabernacle did not. It had storerooms surrounding the building, but accessible from the outside, not the inside, were storerooms. That's where the priests were supposed to keep their implements, but that's also where they hid their idols and their private things, hoping no one would notice that. And if you study that carefully, you discover that's analogous to our subconscious. Well, we're Christians, so you have some fleshly feeling. What do you do? You stuff it down. You hide it. You put on that nice facade, right? And you stuff it. Where are you putting it? In the storerooms. Does that make it go away? So it creates some problems, doesn't it? fills the psychiatric billings, right? God will deal with that, and, uh, and he does. And, but the, the guide is not Freud or some other writer or L. Ron Hubbard or anybody else. <laughs> is is the Holy Scripture, the owner's manual. But that's all another study. If you're interested in that, I do, I think I've done this before, but I unabashedly will tell you that the best materials I've ever seen are the ones that my wife has spent 12 years researching in the way of agape and also be transformed. Two tape series that she gives for women's seminars that has just changed lives all over the world because she's taken the architecture of the temple with great insight, practically, in terms of what that means in terms of Christian law. You notice I use my wife as an example, not me. You know me well enough to know that I'm no example. We'll move on. Verse 3, quickly. <laughs> 
and shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness shall he judge the poor, and reprove the with equity for the meek of the earth, and he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall he slay the wicked. Wow, we could spend the whole evening on that verse. With righteousness he shall judge the poor. Boy, don't we wish we could judge with righteousness. You know what? We can't. You know, if you're, I don't know if there's any lawyers here, but we speak glibly of a court of equity, but there is no such thing. There are, of course, criminal laws, and they have punishments for crimes. That's straightforward. But there's also civil injury and penalties and what have you. And wouldn't we love to right those wrongs in equity? We can't. Equity doesn't really exist in the legal sense. Why? Because we don't know the thoughts of the heart. We can't infer that. The closest we come in practical terms are what's called money damages, but that's often a far cry from the real injuries. When someone's negligence has lost somebody else's use of limbs or eyesight or whatever, money damages is a poor a remedy, no matter what the numbers are. And there's a real dilemma in law is real equity. Why can't we do it? For lots of reasons. By the way, you know that uh, the Bible says that only God knows the thoughts and intents of the heart. How many knew that? How many of you know why it's in the Bible? It's to keep the personality department out of the act. So I just thought I would throw that out. Okay. Not many of you in large corporations, I can tell that. Okay. In righteousness he shall judge the poor and reprove with equity, only God give. For the meek of the earth, he shall smite the earth with a rod of his mouth. You know, it's interesting how often that phrase occurs in the Scripture. I encourage you sometime to take a concordance and just track it down, the rod of his mouth. How often does it occur in the Scripture? And it's interesting that that is all through the Scripture. Revelation chapter 1, verse 16, in the interest of time, we won't go back to chapter 1 again. 2 Thessalonians 2, 8 and elsewhere. What destroys the Antichrist? The brightness of his coming and the rod of his mouth. What comes out of his mouth? A two-edged sword. I'm always amused by these Renaissance painters and stuff that try to see, or Clarence Larkin, where they would try to sketch Jesus Christ with a double-edged sword coming out of his mouth. That isn't intended to be a graphical idiom. It's an idiom from the Scripture. It's a conceptual idiom, not a visual idiom. The rod of his mouth, the two-edged sword is what? The Word of God, you betcha. Two-edged sword comes out of uh, Hebrews 4.12, but again, and also Revelation 1.16. It's interesting how these idioms are consistently used. You see it in the Psalms. You see it in Isaiah. You see it in Revelation 1. You see it in Paul's letter, 2 Thessalonians 2, 8, and so forth. What's fascinating to me about that, don't miss the obvious that you've got one author. The guy that wrote the Psalms, the guy that wrote Revelation, the guy that wrote uh, 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 the Thessalonians. Yes, there were different penmen who really engineered the text, the Holy Spirit. And I don't mean just conceptually. I mean the use of language, use of phrase. And, of course, it goes even much deeper than that. With the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. It's interesting. I'm always thinking of the Garden of Gethsemane, how Peter draws his sword. He's going to defend the Lord, right? The Lord just smiles could have had legions of angels. One angel slaughtered 185,000 Syrians after dinner one night. You don't mess with angels, right? And Christ can call legions at his disposal. He's like, here's Peter drawing a sword, right? But what does Jesus do? He heals the servant that had his ear cut off, right? Why? It saved Peter's life. What would have been the aftermath of that? Peter would have been arrested and so forth. So, Yes, it was probably, I'm not saying he didn't have compassion for the servant, but he's, the, the compassion he had was on Peter. But anyway, I'm getting off the subject again. That's happened to me once before. Verse 5, And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins, and the faithfulness the girdle of his waist. Now, verse 6 on, it really reaches out on the horizon because it's millennial. Verse 6 on refers to the curse that's lifted. Genesis chapter 3, Adam falls, Right? And God pronounces a curse, right? Verse 6 on, many commentators try to spiritualize it, and you don't need to. Take it for what it says. Verse 6, the wolf shall dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf and the young lion, and the fatling together. And a little child shall lead them. 
Do you want to spiritualize that? Allegorize it? Don't need to. It makes sense as it is. It just means that, hey, something's changed. What's changed? The curse is gone. What curse? The curse of sin. The curse that God had established in response to Adam's fall. And the curse goes far beyond just man. It's the universe. Isaiah will say, and Revelation will echo, Behold, I see a new heavens and a new earth. What's being redeemed? More than you and I. The earth. Heaven too. Satan had access to that. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf and the young lion, and the fatling together, and the little child shall lead them, and the cow and the bear shall feed, and the young one shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. It would really be humorous if it wasn't so pathetic if you read how some of the commentators try to twist this around to make some kind of allegorical model. Hey, it's, it, it, it's sliced so many ways. To make it clear, it's just very simple. It's the curse lifted. Genesis 3.15, right? Up an enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. When did the seed of the serpent bruise the heel of the seed of the woman? Calvary. Mm-hmm. When did the seed of the woman crush the head of the seed of the serpent. In effect, at Calvary, you crush his head, what are you crushing? His skull. Where was the cross? Interesting. Idiomatic, symbolic, don't misunderstand me, and yet determinative. The battle is determined. The the outcome of the battle is determined. But that's again, let's get back here to verse 8. The nursing child shall play in the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy all in my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse. Who's that? Jesus Christ. Right on. Who shall stand for an ensign of the peoples, to him shall the nation seek, and his rest shall be glorious. Ensigns were the rallying point. Ensigns are not necessarily a flag, by the way. It was a standard bearer, but that's neither here nor there. What kind of an ensign are we talking about? What is the ensign of Jesus Christ? What is his symbol? You can say the Lion of the tribe of Judah, that's fair, but there's another one that he alludes to in John chapter 3. Don't peek. Do you remember what it was? A strange ensign. There we go. Get a, you get a gold star. A brazen serpent. Jesus says, as Moses raised the serpent in the wilderness, so shall the Son of Man be lifted up. He's making allusion to Numbers chapter 21, verse 9, where, of course, there was the plague. Moses instructed to take a brass serpent, put it on a pole, and anyone that looked up to the pole was cured of the pestilence of these vipers that were biting everybody. Brass serpent. That brass serpent by the way, hangs around. That brazen serpent that Moses did is around in the days of Isaiah. It becomes a problem because people started to worship it. Hezekiah destroys it. See, we make fetishes of things. Whether it's a shroud of Turin or a splinter from Noah's Ark or you name it, we tend not to look to it with some mature perspective. We start kneeling before it in foolishness. So it's interesting, Hezekiah had to destroy it. But it doesn't get destroyed because it ends up, the idea, the concept goes to Alexandria. It becomes the symbol of Aesculapius and thus the symbol of medicine. You ever see the serpent? The single serpent, that's a symbol of medicine. Where does it come from? It goes back, in effect, all the way back to Numbers 21. But let me tell you a funny story. The guy that designed the symbol for the U.S. Army Medical Corps decided to get symmetry. He had two snakes, right? You see, the proper symbol for Asclepius is a single snake. The double snake is Hermes, the goddess of commerce. I always think it's amusing when doctors have the two snakes because it betrays where their heart really is. Little cultural background there that can get you in trouble with your doctor. I'll forego any doctor jokes at this point. You know what the definition of a minor operation is. That's an operation on somebody else, right? Yeah, okay. Anyway, we got down to verse 10 to verse 10. I think we covered the main things out of verse 10. The ensign of the peoples. The ensign is what you gathered troops with, and the ensign is what you also used to gather fugitives, to, to free them, and so forth. It had a number of interesting implements, and as you study all of those, typically in, in Jeremiah and elsewhere, ensigns, you'll discover that uh, Jesus fits all of those. So that's fine. 
But now we get to one of the most interesting verses for you and I. The reason I love Isaiah so much isn't just that he's so messianic and that's exciting. He also so timely. You cannot find a more timely passage in the Scripture than verse 11. I'm following. Or in the book of Isaiah, written, what, seven centuries, eight centuries, whatever, before the birth of Christ. That's a way back, gang. <laughs> Read verse 11 carefully. The Lord says to Isaiah, And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people, who shall be left from Assyria and from Egypt and from Pathros and from Cush and from Elam and from Shinar and from Amath and from the coastlands of the sea. The second time, not the third, fourth, fifth, the second time God is going to recover his people. Well, terrific. When was the first time? Babylon, you betcha. Jeremiah predicted, and they did indeed uh, go to, were slaves in Babylon for 70 years to the very day. Jeremiah said 70 years. It's actually 69 years and two days, but if you take 360 day years, it works to the day. That's interesting. So they're slaves in Babylon for 70 years. What happened then? Cyrus conquered Babylon. Cyrus reads a letter that we're going to come to in Isaiah 44 and 45. He's so impressed finding this letter and mentioning him by name, he frees the Jews to go home. So the Lord brings back a remnant from captivity back to the land, like he promised. That's the first return, the return from Babylon, known idiomatically in the Scripture and among scholars as the exile. That's when Israel was in exile, 70 years in Babylon, slaves to Babylon. Great. They go back, they restore themselves. Ultimately, the Romans take charge. Obviously, in 70 AD, the Romans destroy the city of Jerusalem, and the Jews are scattered throughout the world for roughly 1,800 plus years. The diaspora, the idiom of the wandering Jew, the homeless, pathetic, persecuted Jew. And the climax, in a sense, in the Holocaust in Europe, the conscience of the world, to some extent, maybe it would, some people suggest that the Holocaust was the essential prerequisite to giving them their state, so to speak. Well, whatever. May 14th of 1948, God establishes the nation Israel. And I might mention, at the risk of getting a little technical, is that in Ezekiel, there's a strange passage which predicts 430 years of judgment on the nation Israel, 70 of which we can account for because the 70 years of Babylon subtracted from the 430 leaves you 360 years not accounted for. And scholars try to fit it. It doesn't fit any particular point in history unless you look at it, uh, Leviticus chapter 26, where four times God says, if you don't obey me the first time, I'll multiply your punishments by seven. You say, gee, I'll take the 360 years, multiply by seven, I get 2,520 years. And that's about the time of the diaspora from Babylon on, if you will. Well, problems with that, because I don't think that you use approximate and God in the same sentence. If it fits, and it may not, it was going to fit precisely. But no one had ever bothered to recognize the very thing that Sir Robert Anderson is so famous for in un unraveling Daniel chapter 9 is that God deals in 360-day years for lots of reasons. He did in Genesis and he did all through the Scripture, 360 years. We have reason to believe that in 701 B.C. the Earth went from a 360-day orbit to 365 and a quarter days that we to reconcile the solar to the sidereal calendars as we do today. But that's technicality. The main point is God seems to deal in 360-day years. Fine. Question is, if you take 2,520 years, 7 times 360, if you treat those as 360-day years, it's 907,200, whatever the number of days. The question is, what is that in our calendar? on 365 and a quarter days that we're used to. It turns out it's 2,483 years, 9 months, and 21 days. You say, Chuck, boy, that's exciting. What do I do with that? Well, then you get another problem. You have to ask yourself, when do you start counting? And to do that properly, you discover something else. We speak glibly of the 70 years captivity of Babylon, but it turns out that there are three sieges of Nebuchadnezzar. The first siege of Nebuchadnezzar was in 606 B.C., where he lays siege to Jerusalem and succeeds in the siege, making Jerusalem a vassal province of Babylon. He sets up a vassal king because his dad has died. He's got to go home and take over the empire. So he goes to Nebuchadnezzar the general, comes back as Nebuchadnezzar the king, with a vassal king in Jerusalem. That starts the servitude of the nation. The servitude of the nation starts from the first siege of Nebuchadnezzar. Jeremiah and Ezekiel and others are preaching the people, yield to Nebuchadnezzar, he's God's instrument. The false prophets tell the king and the people, 
No, we're the chosen people. God's going to deliver us. Jeremiah says, no, he's not. He's judging you for 70 years. They consider Jeremiah a traitor, throw him in prison as a traitor. But anyway, the net of it all is that they do rebel, contrary to what Jeremiah said. Jeremiah says, if you rebel against Nebuchadnezzar, God is going to destroy the city of Jerusalem. You're slaves, yes, but at least you have your city, etc. If you rebel, it's going to be destroyed. They don't listen, they rebel. Nebuchadnezzar lays a second siege in Jerusalem, replaces the first king with another king, Zedekiah. And Zedekiah, same thing. Jeremiah says, hey, don't rebel. Ezekiel, said, who's writing from Babylon, says he's a slave, don't rebel. Zedekiah rebels. And uh, by this time, this is Nebuchadnezzar's had a belly full of the whole operation, lays siege and levels the place, destroys Jerusalem, takes them all slaves. That starts a period called the desolations of Jerusalem. There are two periods of time, the servitude of the nation, which starts from the first siege of Nebuchadnezzar, and their slaves to Babylon for 70 years to the very day. The desolations of Jerusalem start with a third siege of Nebuchadnezzar 19 years later. And it also lasts for 70 years. By some strange bureaucratic mix-ups, there's, there's a major delay from the time Cyrus authorized the basics till Artaxerxes Langemanus finally does issue the decree to rebuild Jerusalem. It's also 70 years to the day. The servitude of the nation is 70 years. The desolations of Jerusalem are 70 years. And because they're both 70 years, most commentators, most scholars assume they're synonyms. They're not. They're not coterminous. You say, okay, Chuck, well, what do I do with this 2,483 years, 9 months, and 21 days? If you count from the termination of the servitude of the nation, Israel, you come to May 14th of 1948, when David Ben-Gurion, using Ezekiel as his authority, named the Jewish homeland, new Jewish homeland, Israel. May 14th of 1948. What a coincidence that the nation is established... 2,483 years, 9 months, and 21 days after the terminus of the servitude of the nation. Well, that could be coincidental. The rabbis, of course, have a phrase that coincidence is not a kosher word. The third siege of Nebuchadnezzar, which starts the desolations of Jerusalem, you take your 70 years desolation, count from that period, 2,483 years, 9 months, and 21 days, and you come to June 7th of 1967, when as a result of the Six-Day War, Israel regains control for the first time since Christ's crucifixion, the control of the old city. Interesting, interesting precision. But without getting into all those technicalities, verse 11, it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people. And by the way, it's not just from Shinar. Look where it's from. Who shall be left from Assyria and from Egypt and from Pathros? Pathros was upper Egypt, upper river. And from Cush, Ethiopia. But Ethiopia in a broader sense than the province we know. And from Elam. Read that, Persia. And from Shinar. Read that, Iraq or southern Iraq or Babylon. And from Hamath and from the coastlands of the sea, wherever that is. Is that the U.S. or will you name it? The point is, from all over the world. And he shall set up an ensign for the nations and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. You notice God is blind and he lost ten tribes. He's got the dispersed of Judah and he's got the outcasts of Israel lumped together. The twelve tribes. There are no lost tribes. That's nonsense. The envy of Ephraim shall depart, and the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off. Ephraim shall not envy Judah, and Judah shall not vex Ephraim. Judah is being used as an idiom for the southern kingdom, and Ephraim is an idiom for the northern kingdom. They're no longer going to hassle each other, as they have since the days that Solomon died. But the second time, when is the second time? Started on May 14th of 1948. And by the way, as you and I pick up Time Magazine or Newsweek or the Daily Paper or watch CNN, what are we seeing? Absorption problems in Israel because of all the Russian Jews that are moving into Israel. And we read about the airlifts of the Ethiopian Jews being moved. In. Hey, that not that Kush? Right? And so on. We're watching it happen. The third, fourth time? No, the second time. There's no third or fourth time. This is it, gang. God is moving, as Isaiah said he would. It's happening before our very eyes. 
and just don't just don't let the the familiarity with it mask the amazement you should see knowing the scripture god is moving god means what he says and says what he means amos 3 7 says god does nothing but that which he reveals to his servants the prophets he not only reveals what he's doing he doesn't do anything he hasn't revealed he's doing it it's happening go there and see this has got all kinds of problems because all these russians are trained mathematicians engineers they need farmers and people that can fix automobiles and practical you know, practical people all these russians are brilliant theoreticians and they got some real problems and you see these guys with three or four phds on the street corners uh making falafels or something trying to figure out some way to make a living because these has got problems you know trying to create jobs for all these people highly talented people but not practical and it's any of some very interesting things as you visit Israel and get to know the people as they try to help these people coming in who are, you know, uh, sort of amusingly impractical, many of them. And there's some of those, there's some, see, in the early days of Israel, the people came, there were farmers and peasants and people of the land. And, well, they got problems now because these people come and they have a whole different idea, you know. Uh, they want a job as a theoretical physicist. Well, that's great. How many theoretical physicists does a, you know, a nation need, you know? But in any case, uh, the point is, uh, it's all happening, and it's interesting to watch them uh, uh, adjust. And uh, they are. You watch the neighbors come over and try to help them, and it's uh, it, there's interesting. Uh, it, but the point is, God is doing exactly what Isaiah said in Isaiah eleven eleven, the second time, and this is the second time, gang. Worldwide, regathering, and of course Ezekiel in chapters thirty five, thirty six, and thirty seven deal with that. Point out that they are, but God is going to regather them. And Ezekiel 36, God says, I'm doing it for my reputation's sake, not yours. Let's just pause for a minute, turn to Ezekiel 36. Don't misunderstand. I'm not trying to sound pro Israel in the sense that Israel can do no wrong. Hardly. That's not the point. God says in Ezekiel chapter 36, pick it up about verse 17, Son of man, when the house of Israel dwelt in their own land, they defiled it by their own way and by their doings. Their way is before me as the uncleanness of a defiled woman. Wherefore I poured my fury upon them for the blood that they had shed upon the land and for their idols by which they had polluted it. And I scattered them among the nations, and they were dispersed through the countries according to their way and according to their doings. I judged them. And when they entered into the nations to which they went, they profaned my holy name. And when they said unto them, These are the people of the Lord, and are gone forth of his land. Verse 21, But I had pity for my holy namesake which the house of Israel had profaned among the nations to which they went. Therefore say to the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, I do not this for your sakes, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake, which ye have profaned among the nations to which ye went. And I will, sure, I will sanctify my great name, which was profaned among the nations, which ye have profaned in the midst of them. And, I, and the nations shall know that I am the Lord, uh, the Lord, saith the Lord God, and I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes, for I will take you from among the nations and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. What's God saying? Not because you deserve it, because my reputation is on the line. I told the heathen I was going to do it, so I better do it. My honor's on the line, not yours. You don't deserve it. Is Israel being regathered and blessed by God because they deserve it? No. Because God said he would, and what he, what he says he's going to do, he does. And he is. We watch what's happening. And of course, Ezekiel describes how they're brought together, but not with the Spirit, not in belief. There is an event that will shock them into orthodoxy, so to speak. That's an invasion by the Soviet Union described in Ezekiel 38 and 39, in which five, six of the field forces are wiped out, in which they, the weapons left over provide the energy needs of Israel for seven years, in which they spend seven months before going in the battlefield to clean it up, and then after seven months, they send professionals in to clean it up, to bury the bones east to the Jordan downwind. And if anybody goes through the valley and sees a bone they missed, he doesn't touch it. They mark the location that the professionals come and deal with it. That was Ezekiel 2,500 years ago. That's the event that shocks Israel into really understanding that God is once again dealing with Israel. If God is dealing with Israel, he's not dealing with the church anymore. Daniel 9, the 70-week prophecy. God deals with Israel and the church mutually exclusively. He doesn't deal with the church until Israel rejected the kingdom. Then he deals, calls out a people for his name, compel them, go into highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. And uh, Paul spends three chapters, 9, 10, and 11 of Romans pointing out that God is not through with Israel. He will deal with it when the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Come in where? Romans eleven twenty five. 25. God won't deal with Israel until the church is raptured. Then once again, he will deal with Israel. 
in some heavy-handed ways. Very, that's a whole other thing we'll get to. But in the meantime, to prepare himself for that, he's regathering Israel. How long has he done that? Since 48. And it's intensifying. It's happening before our very eyes. Boy, there's nothing more timely than Isaiah 11.11. 11. It's happening, my friends. Verse 14, But they shall fly upon the shoulders of the Philistines toward the west, and they shall spoil them of the east together, and they shall lay their hand upon Edom and Moab, and the children of Ammon shall obey them. Boy, that'll be new. And the Lord shall utterly destroy the tongue of the Egyptian sea, and with his mighty wind shall he shake his hand over the river. The river here is the Euphrates. And shall smite it in the seven streams and make men go over dry shod. It seems to me he did that once before. And there shall be a highway. There's Isaiah's interesting idiom. He uses the word highway frequently. There shall be a highway for the remnant of the people who shall be left from Assyria, like it was to Israel in the day that he came up out of the land of Egypt. Exciting chapter, chapter 11. Chapter 12 is a short little chapter, and I'd like to sort of, we've got a little time to just whip it off. Uh, Chapter 12 is really a psalm, quite a straightforward psalm in many respects. You can compare it, if you will, in your notes to uh, uh, Exodus um, 15, which is also a hymn of of sorts. There's a number of these in the Scripture, um, but we'll just jump in. Uh, Chapter 12, verse 1, And in that day thou shalt say, O Lord, I will praise thee, and though thou wast angry with me, thine anger is turned away, and thou comfortest me. Pause, friends. That isn't easy to do. Though thou wast angry with me, thine anger is turned away. God cannot do that without it being paid for. God can't forgive sin without it being paid for. That would cloud his integrity. God has anger with sin. Sin is a stench in his nostrils. That has to be dealt with. It has to be dealt with through death. So it says, thou wast angry with me, thine anger is turned away. Hidden in that little comma is the cross. That Jesus Christ paid for it to make it possible for God to turn his anger away and comfort us without violating his integrity. Because he took out the penalty on Jesus Christ. Behold, God is my salvation indeed. That's the whole point. God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid for the Lord. Even the Lord is my strength and my song. He also is become my salvation. It's hard to visualize Isaiah as an Old Testament book. It sounds like it's the New Testament. It sounds like it's written by Paul, doesn't it? I mean, it just it reads like one of Paul's epistles. Anyway, well, it's actually a psalm, but you get what I'm trying to say. Verse 3, Therefore, with joy shall ye draw water out of the wells of salvation. Here's where you can pencil in your notes if you want. 1 Corinthians 10.4. This is where you can pencil in John 4.4. 4. John 7, 37, I am the living water, the woman at the well, all those idioms, a living water. New Testament ideas, no, it comes out of Isaiah chapter 12, verse 3, therefore with joy shall ye draw water out of the wells of salvation. That's not H2O, that's the living water. Revelation 7, Revelation 21, 16, Revelation 22, 17, you can do your own word study on that one. Verse 4, And in that day shall ye say, Praise the Lord, call upon his name, declare his doings among the people, make mention that his name be exalted. His name is exalted. God places his name very high. There's only one thing that's higher than the name of God. His word, you got it. It's amazing when you realize how God, how jealous God is of his name, because you see many passages like Isaiah 12, 4, and yet his word is even above his name. Because his word became flesh and dwelt among us. Pilate asked a cynical question, what is truth? Right? Great definition of truth. When the word and the deed become one. That's truth. Right? When the word and the deed become one. God's word, his promise throughout the Old Testament, becomes fulfilled when the deed becomes fits the word. That is, when the word becomes incarnate, is made flesh and dwells among us and goes to the cross to pay for you and I. Sing unto the Lord, verse 5, for he hath done excellent things. This is known in all the earth. Cry out and shout, thou inhabitant of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel in the midst of thee. 
neat little psalm tucked away in Isaiah, a breath of fresh air. And it ends the first section of Isaiah. The next section is chapters 13 through 23. Isaiah now is going to turn his attention from Israel. See, all this had to do with uh, Judah and Jerusalem and the threat of Assyria and all that. Now he's going to shift gears, and he's going to do a sweep of the nations. Chapters 13 and 14 would be Babylon, 15 and 16 would be Moab, 17 would be Syria through Damascus. Uh, 18 is a little strange. Some writers like to think that the United States is visible in chapter 18. We'll deal with that when we get there. It is some maritime province west of Ethiopia. If it is the U.S., you don't learn anything. There's no great insight from it, but we'll deal with that. Chapter 19 deals with Egypt, but chapter 19 also has a provocative mystery because it mentions what appears to be the Great Pyramid, which was not Egyptian. And it's interesting, they apparently have solved the, the, the writers that have solved the riddle of pyramid inches, and, and, and we'll talk about the pyramid when we get to chapter 19, and the Hebrew value, verse 19 of chapter 19 mentions the Great Pyramid, and the Hebrew adds up to the height of the pyramid in inches. So there's a lot of interesting conjectures that we'll poke around a little bit when we get to chapter 19, be prepared to have seatbelts on and be prepared for some stuff that's really off the wall and probably wrong, but a lot of fun. Verse 20 is Egypt and Ethiopia, I mean chapter 20. Chapter 21 is Edom and Africa, 22 Palestine perhaps, and then 23 Tyre. Now, we're going to take the sweep, but I'd like you this time to do some homework before the next time we meet. Because the next time we meet, we're going to take chapter 13 and a half of chapter 14, and the subject will be Babylon. But I'd like you to do something at one city. The assignment I'd like to give you, I'd like you to execute sometime when you can be undisturbed for, say, half an hour or whatever it'll take you to read, three pairs of chapters, six chapters, but they come each in, they come in pairs. I'd like you, before we meet next time, to read on your own Isaiah 13 and 14. Just read it. I'd like you to read Jeremiah 50 and 51 at the same time. And I'd like you to read Revelation 17 and 18. Isaiah 13 and 14, Jeremiah 15 and 51, and Revelation 17 and 18. And I'd like you to do it at one sitting so that you will pick up the idioms in all six chapters. But you really need to experience it for yourself for you to appreciate the integrity of those six chapters on the one hand and yet the strange differences on the other so that we can deal with this. Because the thing you're going to clearly see is that all six chapters are dealing with the same issue, Babylon. And I don't mean allegorical, mystical, symbolic Babylon. I'm talking about a city that's 62 miles south of Baghdad on the Euphrates being rebuilt today. Don't let anyone tell you that Babylon was destroyed in 539 B.C. Wrong. Don't confuse the fall of Babylon to the Persians with the destruction of Babylon talked about in the Bible. It never happened commentators and Bible dictionaries and Bible handbooks are wrong. Cyrus, if you go to the museum in London, Cyrus the Persian who conquered Babylon brags in the steel of Cyrus there in the London Museum that he did it without a battle. And he did. He conquered Babylon by very, very clever tactics, and we'll go over that. But the point is, Babylon did not get destroyed. It became his capital. A couple hundred years later, when, when uh, Alexander the Great in 322 uh, B.C. conquers the Persians, he makes Babylon his capital. The destruction described in the Bible says it was never to be inhabited. It was destroyed like Sodom and Gomorrah. That's never happened. The destruction of Babylon has never happened. That means it is yet to happen. But how can it? There is no Babylon. Wrong. For the last 19 years, Saddam Hussein has been rebuilding Babylon. We'll talk about that next time. To really understand Isaiah 13 and 14, you need to understand that because you'll never unscramble the confusion that CNN has about the Middle East. They don't know what an Arab is. They don't know what the issues are in Iraq. And unless you have a biblical background, it'll go by you. And yet, if you do have a biblical background, hang on. It is really off the wall and exciting. Babylon is being rebuilt. A few ceremonial buildings, don't misunderstand me, but it is being rebuilt. And Zechariah 5, those of you who want to do a little more homework and dig into the last half of Zechariah 5, and we'll talk about the shift of world power from wherever it is, presumably Europe, to Babylon, the day of the Lord. 
It all started there. It's all going to return there for God to judge it. It's happening before our eyes. And you, if you understand Isaiah 13 and 14 and Jeremiah 15, 51, you have some hope of understanding Revelation 17, 18, which goes even beyond that. Because Revelation 17, 18 is not all allegorical, although part of it is. And we'll try to resolve that next time when we're together. One of the most interesting, provocative, challenging passages in prophecy. But what's the net of it all, friends? Let's not lose sight of the over the big picture. The Bible says that there'll be a super state emerging in Europe at the time of the end. It's happening. With a population three times the United States, an industrial base probably second to, to none, but perhaps Asia is the European super state emerging as we speak. Great. Bible says that Babylon's going to emerge as a superpower both ecclesiastically, politically, and economically. And it's, ha it's beginning, just a thread, but it's visible clearly. It was not a target during the Persian Gulf crisis. How interesting. How is it going to be rebuilt? I don't know. Japan and Germany was built by our money, so we'll see what happens in Iraq. Don't confuse Iraq with Babylon. And don't confuse Babylon with Nineveh, that is Assyria. We'll talk about that. There are a lot of Bible teaching going around that's a little confusing. Be very careful. You need to do your own homework because it's a moving target every day. And what's your anchor point? The Scripture, not some interpretation by Chuck Nistler or anybody else. But you want to do your own homework and watch it, because we're all learning daily what's going on. But your base, your baseline, is what Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and the rest of them lay on, lay on you. And while all this is going, the Bible is looking forward a world leader who's going to be entangled up with the rebuilding of a temple and its subsequent desec desecration. And it's happening. Boy, what does that mean for you and I? It changes priorities if you're paying attention. God is in a hurry. He's moving. It's happening. Well, I shouldn't say he's in a hurry. God is never rushed. I don't mean it that way. But he is moving right along. And uh, shortly these things come to pass. The word shortly in the Greek is a taxa, like a tachometer. Quickly. They are happening quickly. Look at the Berlin Wall. Boy, that caught everybody by surprise. The temple may be the same kind of thing. Babylon may reemerge in, in ways that will catch the secular analyst totally bewildered by surprise. Not you and I, because we have an advantage. We have the script written from outside our time domain, the end from the beginning, history written in advance. Why? For the same reason, that's what, what uh, Jesus said to Abraham. Is, not, is he not my friend? Shall I not show him what's going to happen? Right? The God concept of friendship with God has always dealt with giving a four of you what's happening, right? Jesus said to his disciples, You've been my servants, henceforth ye shall be called my friends. And it was tied to what? His revealing. I go to prepare a place for you and so forth. Right? Interesting. God has chosen to let you and I know what's happening before it happens. Not with some predictive aspect so much as just making us conscious of who he is and to appreciate his glory and his power and his majesty as he sets out to do what the scripture calls his strange work. But it's happening. And boy, is that a time to really do your homework. Learn this book. Find out what they say. Do your homework. It's exciting. You've got a half-time breather. Use it before the game gets underway. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Jesus Christ is the issue. The temple isn't. Babylon isn't. Europe isn't. Jesus Christ is the issue. And he not only wants to be number one on your list of ten, he wants to be number one on your list of one. He wants to be your partner. He wants to be your savior. He wants to be your Lord. He wants to be your intimate, personally, directly. And he will, if you ask him to. He's a gentleman. He won't violate your sovereignty. We speak of the sovereignty of God. The important sovereignty, in a sense, is your sovereignty. Terrifying thing when you realize its implications. The shrewd thing is to hand it right back to him. Quickly. Let him take charge. He'll straighten it out. Don't wait until you got your act together. You'll never get it together. He'll get it together for you. He's done the whole job. But he insists upon doing the whole job. You can't add to it. He's done the whole thing on a cross 1900 years ago. But he would have you learn of him, learn his claims, learn his word, in the old as well as the new. Not a few cliches. The whole counsel of God. Prophecy is not the future. Prophecy is his whole plan in view from beginning to end.